So first, I want to thank you all for um, coming out so early to listen to this talk. And um, I'd really like to thank Shane for organizing this and Alan for um, getting this whole thing together and the Orias program for allowing me to participate. Um, I was fortunate to have a fortunate enough to have a great conversation with Shane um, about teaching these subjects that are covered in um, the whole program this week. Um, and I look forward to talking with you and hearing not only your questions and comments, but um, how you're gonna incorporate this into your teaching. Cause I myself teach world history and I'm quite passionate about teaching. And um, I think I've got a lot to learn from all of you. Um, so today what I'd like to do, let me change my slide. Um, today what I'd like to talk with you about is um, two forms of unfree labor that would be debt bondage and human trafficking. And these took place in the context of a sex industry. Um, and I'd like to look at an example of a state response to this program. Um, and in this case, it would be the French colonial state and how the state capitalized on the moral outrage against trafficking unfree labor, slavery, um, but then use that outrage to affect policies that benefited the state. Um, so today I'll talk about my research on unfree labor, and I want to um, complicate this notion of free and slave. And so, therefore, you know, like many of the speakers, I chose this the word unfree laborers. Um, and these are laborers, who, the way I define it in my research, I found um, unfree laborers were laborers who um, earned no wages for their work and could be compensated indirectly for their work. Um, and then there's a the big question of choice. And so um, as I'll talk about more, um, I draw from this notion of a continuum of choice. And on one end, you have those who, you know, who were completely against sex work and did not choose to, um, to do sex work. And then you have those who are, um, who actually got into it voluntarily. And then you have those who are in between, and we'll talk all about that. And so this notion of continuum of choice comes from Elisa, um, Elisa Camisholi's work on French women in Argentina. Um, so before I begin, I'd like to talk about the market for which their labor was used. And I'd like to talk about um, my work on the um, black market sex industry in Vietnam, in Northern Vietnam during the colonial period. So here, shameless plug, um, this is the cover of my book, Black Market Business. Um, sex work was legal and regulated in colonial Vietnam. Um, it was very different from the Anglophone countries at this time um, in, that were um, in Anglophone countries. There's a big movement to abolish sex work on moral grounds, um, as well as because of venereal, the spread of venereal disease. It was believed that um, sex workers were the vector of transmission for venereal disease. Um, turns out men can spread venereal disease too. Um, and um, as you know, there's the, um, in the late 19th century where the Contagious Disease Acts, which um, were passed in Anglophone countries and um, they greatly limited women's freedom. Um, and let me just take a second here to say that um, I'm, my research is on women in the sex industry. Certainly there were men who were involved in the sex industry. Um, and certainly there were women who took uh, female clients. The problem is I couldn't, I couldn't find anything more than anecdotal evidence, um, just a few anecdotes about that. So the majority of the historical evidence that I found was about um, women in the sex industry who were um, uh, who had clients who were men. So it's heterosexual sex work by women. Um, although anecdotal evidence tells me that there were male sex workers and there was same sex sex work. Um, it's just I didn't have it. I couldn't find enough to write about that. Um, the French tol the French called it, they had this legal regulated um, sex industry. They called it the tolerance system. Um, and this was a system of legal regulated prostitution. Um, at, but the regulation system, so women could choose to go into it and, um, and it was perfectly legal, but it was problematic. Um, the first thing is, is that women had to register with the state um, and it was very difficult to get their name off of the police register of prostitutes. And, um, you know, it's kind of damning to have your name uh, registered as a prostitute. Um, the registration movement also, sorry, the registration system also restricted women's movement. Um, it forced them to pay taxes on their earnings. Um, they had to submit to very invasive gynecological exams. And a lot of women were raped by the doctors who were giving those, um, who were administering those exams. Um, for those women who tested positive for venereal disease, they were locked up in um, what the English called a lock hospital. The French um, called it, well, it was called a loopsie in Vietnamese. Um, they call it clinique in French. Um, 
when they were locked up in the lock hospital, that meant that um, they got no income. There was no support for their family because a lot of times these women were selling sex in order to support their family. And um, there was even one terribly sad case of a woman who, um, a sex worker who was locked up in the lock hospital. And, and by the way, this is before antibiotics. So um, lot, the idea of these lock hospitals, these clinics was to cure the women of venereal disease, but you, they basically just saw the women pass through to the third phase of syphilis essentially where it goes dormant. So they weren't actually being cured. So they were kind of locked up indefinitely um, until syphilis went dormant or gonorrhea or whatever it was. Um, and in this one terribly sad case, this woman had um, a child, she had a, um, a nursing infant and they locked her up for so long that there was no one to take care of her child and the child couldn't eat and the child died because she was locked up for so long. Um, there were also, so, so because this registration system was so strict, um, it became a disincentive for women to register as sex workers with the state. Um, moreover, there were legal loopholes in the system. Um, the protection, Tonkin was, so Northern Vietnam was called Tonkin at the time, um, and it was a protectorate, it was not a colony. So in colonies, French law was administered directly and the French ruled everything down to kind of, you know, the school board. Um, in the protectorate, indigenous law prevailed and the French government, the colonial government um, kind of took care of external affairs and kind of um, advised the, um, the head of state, which would be the Vietnamese emperor. Um, however, Vietnamese law prevailed. Now in Tonkin, there were Vietnamese law prevailed but there were French concessions and those French concessions were direct colonies. They were small little islands, like, um, you know, major, it included major cities, um, military bases, um, things like coal mines and railroad junctures um, and provincial capitals. So there were these little dots on a map that were directly administered by French law. And so what you got there is this kind of very confusing patchwork of legal systems throughout colonial Tonkin. Well, the, and, and by the way, when I say that, that meant that the French only had control to police these small jurisdictions. So it was urban areas essentially and military bases. Um, but even, so, so French laws, um, the tolerance system, pr prostitution, sex work was only legal and regulated in those areas and police, French police could only um, regulate sex work in those areas. So you, it was very difficult for the French to control both the legal sex industry, but also the black market sex industry, which is what I studied in my book. Um, even in French controlled areas, the police had their hands tied because French laws, uh, France, France had very strong privacy laws, which I'm sorry, my contact is having giving me problems. Um, even French privacy laws um, prohibited the police from entering private businesses. So um, this is actually a case, usually, you know, in my last book, I studied colonialism and I studied this big, strong state that had all this power over in what I was looking at, indigenous women, Vietnamese women, this big, strong state with all this power over indigenous women. And then when I came to study sex work, prostitution, I noticed that it was the exact opposite. It was a state that had very little powers. Const its hands were tied by its own laws. Um, so consequently, a black in market sex industry prevailed. It developed um, and it enabled women to avoid the regulation system. And this black market grew to be a th thorn in the side of the French colonial government. Um, it was a thorn in the side of the French colonial government because the government, the French could not regulate the sex industry. Um, and they felt that it was spreading sex war, uh, sorry, spreading um, venereal disease. And venereal disease was labeled the number two um, medical, uh, most important medical problem in colonial Indochina and Tonkin in particular. Um, and so they always wanted to police sex work, but they didn't have the power to do that, especially for the unregulated sex work, because there's these legal loopholes, as I mentioned, the, the patchwork of um, the application of law plus um, privacy laws that forbade it. And so we'll see how that kind of plays out. Um, for the women involved in the black market sex industry, um, these, the black market sex industry was actually quite dangerous. They lost all protections of the state, however minimal those may have been. Um, and then there's another issue, which is the issue I'd like to talk about today is unfree labor in the sex industry. And this was rampant. Um, sex workers, um, unfree labor in this case meant that sex workers earn no wages for their labor. Um, and this was very common, not just in the sex industry, but it was common throughout colonial Vietnam in many different industries. And we'll talk about that in a second, as well as much of Southeast Asia. And the two forms 
that I found in the colonial sex industry were debt bondage and human trafficking, which we'll talk about. So now, if you don't mind, um, by the way, this is, let me just explain this uh, picture right here is, um, if you notice it's got a stamp on it, it's a postcard um, and it's a Vietnamese woman, um, it's a Vietnamese sex worker. And so the French went around, they love taking postcards, postcard pictures to send home of um, weird things they saw in the colony. And so um, it could be all different kinds of things. But in this case, there's a, um, a collection of postcards, I think five or six of them that were made of sex workers that they sent home you know, to their mom and their dad and whatnot. Um, Okay, so now let's talk about debt bondage. So debt bondage is when you pay off monetary debt through labor for a definitive time. So this means you're temporarily foregoing your salary until the debt is paid. This is a common practice in many industries in um, Northern Vietnam. You see this in the plantation labor industry. In fact, um, Micheline Lessard is writing a great book on this. Um, it involved actually, you know, debt bondage and plantation labor involved the French colonial state as well as French companies. So this is not just, um, you know, some black market thing that's happening. This is state-sponsored debt bondage. Um, you see it also in the construction industry, in domestic labor industry, and as well as the sex industry, which I am going to talk to you about today. So why would workers enter into debt bondage agreements? Well, you have it, again, looking at the broad picture of debt bondage. Um, peasants did it between growing seasons because they actually went into debt to grow their um, their farm, their um their product, their agricultural product. They had to buy seeds, they had to buy equipment, they had to rent the land and whatnot. Um, also, there were usury scams that targeted the poor. Many people needed to pay gambling debts or some sort of family obligation debt, such as wedding or funeral. Um, the debt bondage, and a lot of times, um, in those cases, they would actually sell off, they would um, enter their daughters into debt bondage for sex work, um, or they would do it themselves. Um, debt bondage, the way it functioned was, um, either you had a debt or you had a cash advance, um, or you could have room and board or something, um, or a transfer of debt, kind of a debt amongst family members, as I mentioned. Um, peasants kind of took out a debt to pay for a house or to pay for their growing season, and the child does labor. Daughters would often do domestic labor or sex work, um, or it could be creditors sold the debt to another creditor, and that was paid through bondage. Um, Although um, debt bondage preceded colonization and urbanization, colonization and urbanization greatly exacerbated it. Um, and you see the, the what you're seeing during the colonial era is this consolidation of farmland under large corporations. So now suddenly you've got all these landless peasants. Um, you also have mass building projects in the city. So it's attracting um, migrant workers who had no, um, uh, no, um, uh, support system in the city when they came to work, and so they needed room and board. Um, it also attracted those, those peasants who lost their land in the land consolidation efforts. Um, and so the poor migrated to the big cities. They had no place to stay. They had no, no, um, no money to deposit on a place to stay. They had no food. So a lot of times debt bondage turned into this um, um, exchange for room and board in the cities. And so how does that play out in the sex industry? Well, for those who voluntarily entered debt bondage, why did they make that choice is a question, one of the questions I asked. And what I found through my research is that a lot of it has to do with the social constraints and the social expectations on women in um, you know, early to mid 20th century Vietnam. Um, women were expected to live with their family until marriage. Um, and a lot of these women that I studied were leaving domineering parents, um, they were fleeing arranged marriages or leaving bad marriages. Um, oftentimes when they left, landlords didn't trust single women because they felt that they were, they were sex workers. Um, and as a result, they had trouble finding housing once they got to the city. Um, and so a lot of them needed immediate housing. Um, for these women, there were few attractive jobs that were available. Um, many of these jobs that were available to women were um, labor intensive. So women did construction work or factory work, which was really just labor intense. And it's not that these women couldn't find a job. It's just they didn't like the jobs that they were finding because, well, you know, who wants to break their back in the tropical sun trying to build a road? Um, a lot of their work was demeaning or dangerous. Domestic labor, like working as a maid in somebody's house was extra, or working, you know, take, doing childcare was actually very dangerous because you're living in somebody's house. And oftentimes the male family members 
take an interest and rape these women. Um, they were also beaten by their employer and there's no one to oversee it. There's, you know, you're basically trapped in a house. Um, other jobs required an education like a school teacher or other requirements like a wet nurse. You gotta be pregnant first in order to lactate. Um, and, and also being a wet nurse, ex extremely, extremely difficult. Sometimes these women had to pay off debt elsewhere, um, such as family debt or to support their family. Um, daughters supported parents, mothers supported their children or their husbands. Um, a lot of these women were fleeing other brothels. They were free fleeing registered brothels um, and they had to pay off debt that they owed to the owner of a registered brothel. So debt bondage could potentially be a form of social mobility, helps these women to break dependence on their family, to pursue possibly lucrative and maybe even glamorous careers in this new profession, um, because this 1920 to 45 was this um, very new generation in Vietnam, where it's um, 1920 was the first, like kind of, I look at it this break at 1920s, first generation of girls graduating from French schools, the first time that women have um, a widespread education um, with these French schools, they're introduced to French culture. And then you see French culture coming to Vietnam in the form of movies, magazines, um, music. And so now these women are um, living a life with new, uh, like, um, new opportunities for leisure, um, dance halls, um, new fashion, which is what my current book is on, um, and new um, other forms of culture like uh, um, literature, they're learning about romance, um, which beforehand there was arranged marriages. Now um, they're not, uh, now the French are kind of offering this opportunity of you choose your own mate and premarital sex and whatnot, which was incredibly shunned in Vietnamese society beforehand. So now suddenly sex work looks, you know, it looks fun. It looks glamorous. It's, you know, you can go out there, flirt with boys, wear pretty clothes and, um, and maybe even pick up a man who was getting you good presents. Um, the mechanics of debt bondage, as I sort of started to mention is cash advance. So usually these women had left their family with no, with nothing. They get room and board because these women had originally had no safety, social safety net. And um, in the process of this, you get clothing and jewelry, which was necessary to attract clients. Um, so it could be potentially a form of social mobility offered to women that wasn't there before. However, there's a downside, which is that sex workers, debt bondage sex workers were easily exploited by their employers. Um, there was no legal protection for them. Um, employers frequently added compound interest on their loans. They devalued sex workers' earnings in order to um, extend the duration of their debt bondage contract. Um, they falsely claimed to have given a cash advance in order to hold these women against their will in a, in a debt bondage agreement that they, these women never agreed to. Um, or they tricked the women into sex work. Most frequently, um, they offered debt bondage agreements for a bait and switch employment. So these women oftentimes thought that they were working as a hostess in a restaurant or something um, only to get there, arrive there and find out that it wasn't a restaurant. It was like a, an ad out singing house and um, they were forced into prostitution, into sex work. So how did these women get out of um, exploitative debt bondage um, uh, contracts? Well, some of them found ways to repay the compounded interest loan. Um, others married and their husbands, if they were lucky, their husbands had enough money to pay off their debt. Um, many of them ran away and just robbed their employer on the way out. Who could blame them? Um, sometimes families intervened to free their daughters. Um, women or their families appealed to the police. That was rarely successful, though. Uh, oftentimes, authorities enforced debt bondage contracts. Um, they took the employer's word as the truth, or the police were corrupt in getting bribes. Um, some, oftentimes, they just didn't believe sex workers because they were misogynistic or because they discriminated against the poor. Um, it's too easy to focus on exploitation when we talk about this and dismiss debt bondage as a form of slavery, which is exactly what the French government would do. Um, but instead, we should look at it as playing an important sociological role in all industries. Um, there was a benefit to debt bondage agreements, which was a potential path to social mobility. But as I mentioned, it's very problematic because it was ripe for exploitation. So it's more helpful, I argue, to think of debt bondage as um, a continuum of choice. And here I draw from Elisa Camasholi's idea on um, her kind of understanding of um, French women who were um, who are working in the sex industry in colonial, uh, sorry, in, um, in Argentina, it's not col colonized by the French, but in Argentina. 
Um, and um, in this, these cases, these women, and in the case of colonial Vietnam, um, these women entered debt bondage contracts with either full or incomplete knowledge or incomplete information about the work agreement to which they were entering. Um, for, it was a temporary step towards freedom for those who had full information about um, the degree of, you know, about, um, about what they were doing. And it kind of gave them a degree of agency. Um, incomplete information left them vulnerable to exploitation and to coerced sex work. And then there's the in-between, which is those who had full information about what they were getting into, but had violent bosses, had um, bosses who tricked them along the way and so forth. So this is why I'm really careful to refer to debt bondage as unfree labor, because it was, um, it was such a complicated situation. Okay, now I wanna to turn to a second form of unfree labor, which is trafficking. And, and I wanna be very careful to note that um, trafficking and debt bondage were um, oftentimes overlapped. Um, they, they, oftentimes, you know, a woman could enter debt bondage with an agreement and then she was trafficked throughout, or she could be trafficked and completely, you know, not wanting to be part of this, and um, in order to get out of this trafficking situation, she went into a debt bondage situation where she transferred her debt, her supposed debt for something that you know, she didn't agree to, um, and used debt bondage to pay off those traffickers to get her freedom. Um, so trafficking also got the attention of the authorities. This would be a huge embarrassment for the French, as well, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, they, and the French would use the rhetoric of the anti-trafficking movement to kind of cut through some of the red tape around unregistered sex work. Um, it gave the state to a way to police unregistered sex work in ways that were not actually permitted by the law. Um, like debt bondage, trafficking was common in many sectors of the economy in Indochina. Um, trafficking did predate the French colonization and Micheline Lessard um, has written about this. Um, and you see these kind of voluntary or forced migrations of not just women and children, but also men um, in trafficking. And you see trafficking in many forms of the industries, um, in many industries in the economy, um, the plantation labor, factory work, um, domestic work, reproductive economy. Um, and trafficking usually um, shuffled women um, around, in, we're looking specifically at Northern Vietnam, it shuffled women around the Mekong Delta, which was the most populated and um, labor intensive area of Tonkin, uh, sorry, not Mekong Delta, excuse me, I meant to say the, the Red River Delta. Um, it shuffled women from countryside into urban areas, from city to city. It also connected to international human trafficking networks um, in Asia. So they went by land or by sea to China, to Phnom Penh in Cambodia, in um, Bangkok in Thailand, what's modern day Thailand, um, and also to Singapore. The hotspots for trafficking were along established waterways, trade routes and waterways, um, ports, um, uh, like in ports, uh, uh, railroad junctures, um, around mines and big labor, kind of construction activity, um, and around border towns. So what's a state to do? Well, this was a huge embarrassment for the French. Um, as you're probably aware, when you studied the, when you learned about the Haitian Revolution, the French tried to abolish slavery a couple of different times, and they finally succeeded in 1848. Um, and um, by the 1870s, the Third Republic motto was um, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And the Third Republic French government was very proud of this, however hypocritical that was in the context of colonialism. Um, but so, so for the French, you know, they're very proud to be anti-slavery, um, to, you know, to free their slaves, um, uh, to free people who were enslaved, excuse me. Um, and they were proud of this third Republic model of, you know, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. Um, but there were legal complications, as I mentioned before. Um, you know, I mentioned that, that Tonkin was a protectorate. The French law only applied in these small concessions. Um, and so the French had a hard time stopping and policing trafficking. Well, the League of Human Rights was constantly pressuring France to do something about this. And so the state would increase um, policing at ports and along waterways. Um, and then also there was this international anti-trafficking movement. It began in the late 19th century and it, was, um, it kind of grew out of the anti-slavery movement. And their initial concern was something called white slavery, which is this fear 
of white women being trafficked by people of color um, and sent places for slavery and the, you know, people of color, Jews, um, and the, you know, this international cabal. And you know, historians have since figured out that it probably didn't exist. Um, but that was their main fear. In 1921, the international anti-trafficking movement changed their direction and they decided they were no longer concerned with just white slavery, um, but they were concerned with the trafficking, the coerced sex of all women. Um, and they particularly in 1921 singled out the French. They singled them out for their tolerance system, this regulated um, sex works, this regulated prostitution system. And they said that even regulated prostitution, that regulated prostitution, even if it was voluntary, it created this market for buying and selling the French, uh, buying and selling women, excuse me. Ooh, this was a big problem for the French because the French were really proud of their, um, they were really proud that they didn't demonize sex work as um, a crime. Uh, in fact, in 1802, sex work's been legal in France since 1802, and um, it was viewed as a um, victimless crime. And so therefore it's legal yet regulated. And the French were really proud that they did this. They were proud on one level because of what it meant for women's rights. And they're proud on another level because they viewed themselves as not being um, so uptight and Puritan like the Anglophone countries. Um, so now they're being singled out for trap, you know, for being a site of trafficking. And they, they didn't wanna give up their regulated sex industry. Um, so they resisted abolishing the tolerance system of regulated prostitution, but they continued to pass laws to um, as much as they could that focused on trafficking, anti-trafficking laws, and to increase policing. But trafficking prevailed. And that's because, like I said, this is a case where you see a colonial state that was actually had its hands tied. It couldn't, it wasn't that big, powerful state that, for example, I wrote about in my first book. Um, why did these trafficking programs prevail again? You know, because they were the kind of David against these big colonial states that had so much power. Um, well, the strength in trafficking was in its disorganization. Um, you had these multiple loosely organized, smaller networks, lots of lone wolf actors, and consequently, it's really difficult for the police to disrupt the logistics of trafficking systems. So let's dig a little deeper into the trafficking networks and how it happened. And by the way, I should say these pictures here, um, this woman is alive. I know it's very um, disturbing, this picture. She is alive. This is a woman. These, are picture, these pictures were um, printed in, um, I think it was in um, Ngai Ngai or Phong Hoa, I can't remember where I got it from, um, which were Vietnamese um, newspapers at the time. And so they were, uh, this, it, it, trafficking was all over the Vietnamese newspapers. There were um, um, little like ads published by parents saying, you know, where did my child go? You know, this is what my child looked like. Can you help me find her? Um, and she was just stolen in the night. Um, and there would be ads, like these are pictures of um, trafficking boats that were found in, um, uh, in Tonkin in the, um, in the Bay of Halong. Halong Bay had um, over, has, it's a really beautiful if you go there, but it has over a thousand limestone islands in the bay. So it's very easy to, um, to avoid the traffic, the police, like the customs police, the maritime police. Um, but the other reason that it's easy to kind of hide behind the islands because those um, limestone caves, those limestone islands have caves in them. And so the caves are constantly being used by traffickers. Um, and so here's a picture of a boat um, and they found that this island behind it had caves in it. Um, and so you'll see some of these pictures, the pictures that I show you are um, gonna be of what, what they found of the traffickers at the time. Um, so let's dig deeper into this. How did trafficking happen? Well, um, oftentimes families wittingly or unwittingly sold their daughters into, um, into the trafficking industry. Um, wittingly, let's talk about that. Well, for one thing, one thing it could have been just um, bad parents, um, a father, you know, I have stories of fathers coming in drunk and um, selling their daughter, their 12 year old daughter's virginity because they knew that they could get in, you know, they could get a lot of money for virginity. Um, other times it wasn't as nefarious. Um, sometimes they needed to guarantee, they sold their daughters because it guaranteed that like into trafficking networks because it actually guaranteed the daughter's survival. And here's what I mean by this. They knew that if they sold their daughter into trafficking networks, be it for domestic service, like domestic work or for sex work, it guaranteed their daughter's survivor, survival because the traffickers had the incentive to keep the girls alive and, and relatively healthy so that the girls could perform a form of labor. So this is parents who were you know, down and out for economic reasons because they were sick, um, because they owed debt, you know, whatever it could be, they couldn't take care of their kids and they knew their kids could survive, however horrible it was, 
This is a way to make sure that they stay alive. Other times it was large families, nine, 10 children, and they couldn't feed all those mouths. Um, and in the Vietnamese cosmology of things, um, daughters would eventually leave the family anyway to get married. Sons would follow the family line. And this not only was for sociological things, but also it was a religious uh, idea, it's kind of cosmological idea that when you die, it's actually your sons who continue the family line. And the son's family, in theory, is supposed to worship, is supposed to take care of the ancestral spirit um, and do things, you know, votive papers and whatnot. And so um, these families were guaranteeing the survival of the sons and um, sacrificing the daughters. And however terrible that sounds, the idea to them was the daughters would eventually leave the family anyway when they got married. And you can see, see this in Vietnamese society today when, uh, I mean, obviously they don't sell their daughters off, but um, you can still see it in Vietnamese society when you talk about grandparents, for example, um, your um, om noi versus your om, uh, om noi. Om noi is your mother's family. And that's, sorry, om noi is your father's family. And that's your, in, literally noi means inside, your inside grandfather. And om noi is your outside grandfather, grandfather. And it's literally the same word used for, you know, outside of your house versus inside of your house. So that's why those families sold their daughters. Um, some families unwittingly sold their children into the sex industry. They um, entrusted a family member or a friend to take care of their child if they were sick or, you know, if they had to travel far for labor, you know, for a job or something like that, they, they entrusted their daughter to a family, like, you know, to another auntie or to a family friend and that person turned around and sold their daughter. Um, other times girls got into the sex industry because they were, the trafficking industry, because they were kidnapped. Um, there was something called Matmin kidnappers who were really interesting. Um, phenomenon that is still talked about today. Like if you want to discipline your child in Vietnam today, you, you say to them, like, you go upstairs and you clean your room, you better do it because otherwise the map man is going to get you. Um, and the map man were these old lady kidnappers who roamed the countryside. Um, they were elderly, unmarried or widows. So there were oftentimes few social safety nets for these women um, and trafficking gave them an income. I don't mean to excuse them. I'm just trying to look for sociological reasons for why this happened. Um, if they were older women, most likely they were gonna not be as strong as their victims. So how did they do it? Oftentimes they drugged them using ether, they lured them in, they, um, the documents often talk about them bewitching girls, um, which I think is they were hypnotizing them. Um, they tricked them oftentimes with um, bait and switch promises of employment, and they sold them to brothels in Vietnam um, with which they had existing relationships. So I found a lot of cases of the men um, going back to the same, the same brothel um, and getting paid. And the brothel was like, okay, I'm going to need five more girls. Call up the men, which they didn't use the telephone, but I'm going to use one. Um, they <laughs> called up the men and were like, we need five more girls. Go find us. Some of the men, you know, kidnapped five girls and brought them to the brothel. The men also sold these girls to Chinese trafficking gangs. So let's now turn to the Chinese trafficking gang. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep it at that one. To these Chinese trafficking gangs. Um, these gangs were likely what we know of as the triads, but they never used that word. So I want to be very careful to say that it's possible that they weren't. Um, the Chinese gangs were very successful because, um, in part, because of legal loopholes. Um, Chinese in Indochina had special immigration status. They could enter and leave Vietnam more easily than other foreigners. They had special maritime um, rights and trade rights, which um, prevented their ships from getting searched uh, by, the, by the customs officers. So they also, um, another thing is until 1929, China did not have a birth registry, which meant there was no way of proving or disproving familial relations. So traffickers, um, when they were questioned, they often claimed that these girls were their daughter or their niece or something. And the girls were beaten into submission and forced, you know, you know, so that the girls wouldn't talk and reveal that they could only speak Vietnamese. Um, trafficking went both ways. Um, Vietnamese women were trafficked up to China, often by land or sea. Shanghai was a huge destination for them. Um, and Chinese women were also trafficked down into uh, Vietnam. Now, the French government, for its part, genuinely wanted to um, stop trafficking. Um, in the 1920s, they um, enacted measures to eradicate debt bondage, but the problem was these measures basically um, put the debtors in legal uh, danger. 
1932, they placed Chinese ships under surveillance, despite the special status that Chinese ships had. They deployed secret police around Hanoi to catch the men. Um, in 1937, they increased punishment for trafficking. Um, and then 1937 hits, and there's another conference amongst the League of Nations, again on anti-trafficking. Um, and this was held in the Dutch East Indies, and it focused on colonies. And it was a huge embarrassment for the French because they specifically called out the French. Again, that French brothel system, the legal tolerated brothel system. And they said that it was, it was creating this market for Vietnamese women to be trafficked into the regulated brothel system. Um, and it, um, it, they, and part of it was they said that even voluntary, voluntary sex work, what they, the way they spoke about it, even voluntary sex work was considered trafficking. So this is a huge embarrassment for the French um, because of, as I told you before, 1848, they had abolished trafficking. They viewed themselves as being um, really progressive with their um, liberty, equality, and brotherhood. Um, and in a social Darwinian way of understanding colonialism, they saw, um, they saw the colonialism, they justified colonialism that they were protecting the people that they colonized. And they certainly weren't protecting them from trafficking. Well, as much as that was an embarrassment, the French governor general, um, a, a fellow by the name of Jules Prévier, uh, took advantage of this situation in two ways. Now, Jules Prévier is really interesting because I studied him in my last book, um, which was on um, uh, mixed race children who were forcibly removed by the colonial government. And Jules Prévier has this great way of um, taking these hot button emotional topics and um, reappropriating the language of them. So in the case of mixed race kids, everybody thought how terrible it is that these kids are, um, these half French kids are living in poverty. And he's like, that's right, absolutely. And use that as justification for removing them from their moms. Uh, when it was legally, they weren't allowed to do that. And in this case, Jules Prévier, um, he's such a shrewd guy. He took these, um, this 1937 um, condemnation of the French and the regulation system and said, you know what, you're right. This is really terrible, this, this, tra you know, this enslavement and trafficking. Instead of using that to, um, to work on the regulation system, he turned, he, he refocused attention on trafficking. Um, and not only on trafficking, but he used it as a way to um, allow the police to get into um, spaces that they weren't allowed to get into, they weren't legally allowed to get into, and I'll explain this. Um, and this, my friends, is why it's so important to pay attention to state responses to these emotionally charged issues such as trafficking, um, because the state used it to affect other less popular initiatives. Um, so he redirected the conversation from the French brothel system to trafficking and the black market of um, the black market sex industry. Um, this is his way to avoid criticism, and um, he cited specifically the Mountman and the Chinese traffickers, and he used the moral, like this moral outrage around trafficking as a pretext to police and raid female entertainment spots. So that would be singing houses and dance halls, which were sites, very known sites for unregistered sex work. And so here is um, a picture of a, a street called Kam Tien Street, which was very famous. It had hundreds of singing houses and dance halls. Um, and this is a um, Vietnamese singer. Um, it was called A Dao Singing. Um, and now it's, if those of you who are familiar with Vietnamese culture, it was the um, kind of ancestor to Ka Chu singing. It's a very beautiful form of singing, but sex work was associated with it. Um, and so these singing and dance halls were very known, well known for unregistered sex work. And um, they were located, like Kam Tien Street was located just like meters, just outside of um, the, uh, not meters, I should say a little bit more than a couple of meters, but um, just outside of the, the um, boundaries for the city of Hanoi, which meant that Hanoi was French concession um, so it was, legalized by, it was regulated by French laws. Kam Tien was outside of the concession, so the French police couldn't touch it, but they still benefited from this large urban population base. Um, and the state was just dying to just get in there and regulate um, and, and tax Kam Tien because they knew there's a lot of money to tax there. Also because they believed that um, the dance halls and the singing houses were sites of um, transmission of venereal disease, which was a major problem for the French state. But the French state couldn't, touch them because of the legal loopholes. They're outside of the colonial ju jurisdiction and they were private businesses. So in 1939, Jules Prévier um, enacted a, um, a law to protect, so to say, singers and dancers. Um, and he's responding and he specifically cited 
1937 condemnation by the League of Nations, um, and he cited Nat Man and Chinese traffickers. Um, and so it was actually a way to regulate singing halls and dance halls, which you know I mentioned are both the sites of, um, of sex work. Um, and so what were the stipulations of the law? Well, for one thing, they forbade debt bondage. Um, all singers and dancers had to be paid in cash. There was no cash advance for, um, for jewelry. Excuse me, there could be a cash advance, but it wasn't worth more than two months of salary for jewelry, clothing, or housing. Um, singers who boarded in the dormitory could not be uh, um, bored in lieu of salary. So the dormitory charge could not, ex could not be this, uh, the same as or exceed the price of their uh, paycheck. Um, it was forbidden to hold them against singers and dancers against their will, and there was no transfer of debt. Um, they tried to prevent unregistered sex work in the dance hall, so no men staying overnight. Um, they enacted curfews. They required vocational training for the singers to make sure they were legit singers and dancers. Um, and that uh, meant that the women had to be educated in singing, like kind of school dance, singing schools and dancing schools for three months. Um, they had to use recruiting agents and dance teachers. But you know, the problem is, is that creates middlemen and that drove the women deeper into debt to pay for the middlemen and to pay for that three months of education. Um, and it left them even more vulnerable to corrupt officials and uh, and you know and debt. Um, and it gave the state this 1937 law gave the state the right to police and raid these establishments that broke the rules above in these establishments that were female forms of entertainment. So it was an effective, it proved to be an effective way for the police to, um, for the state to police clandestine prostitution, clandestine sex work, and female entertainment in the name of preventing human trafficking. So what I want you to take from this is this unfree labor that existed in Indochina, in Tonkin, it was very common in Vietnam in many forms of the labor industry, but you know, in particular in the sex industry. And it affected women particularly because of their role in the family and the social expectations on them. Um, and, and unfree labor became very common in the sex industry. Um, and it was a form, it was both a form of social mobility for them, but it could also be incredibly easily exploited. Um, and the state capitalized on, you know, the, the international community erupted and they were really upset by the way that the women were exploited. Um, and the state capitalized on this. Um, and they took this emotionally charged topic and they said, well, that's a good way for me to, to get at that black market sex industry. And they used it to regulate, to, um, to legitimate police regulation of um, the sex in, this black market sex industry and of female entertainment forms and to reclaim their tax revenue. And that's it. Thank you. Um, I, that was fantastic. Thank you so much.